Hello everybody and welcome back. In today's video, we discuss everything to do with the stock, commodity and crypto markets right now, including the key levels that you need to be watching right now and the markets that you need to be taking a look at. There's quite a few different things that are going on. Everyone's got their focus on commodities and metals, maybe rightfully so, but there's some other breakouts that are starting to appear that look very good for the longer term as well. So sit back and let's talk about it all right now. Stay tuned. This is sure to be a good one. So welcome back to our daily recap show here where we cover everything to do with the stock, crypto and commodities markets. If you like any of those things, then remember to subscribe and of course, smash the like button if you do find value in this video, it does help us out. This is for the market close 8th of March, 2022. So we're starting to hit this peak pinnacle of bad news for the oil trade. Obviously, oil pushes higher after US escalates Russian sanctions with a ban and the UK is coming with them. You probably expect other countries to also jump on this, and that will be something that is discussed over the next coming days, if not weeks. But the oil trade, as we know, is almost bonkers right now. Many people are putting it next to crypto in terms of the moves. They're saying the new crypto is oil. <laughs> it's a pretty funny statement, but you know it's true in terms of the current moves. Let's talk about the broader market. So this is the big market. These are the S&P 500 companies, and we'll go through today, obviously, commodities, stocks, crypto, indices, everything. But over here, you'll notice that it was some sectors really taking a beating. In particular, we had a little bit of healthcare kind of going down, and we had a pretty decent stabilization in the growth stocks. They were the ones that got beaten in the previous market trade. So let's take a look at what happened with Wall Street. Well, they were incredibly sneaky. Yesterday, we suspected on the S&P 500 and NASDAQ that there would be a bounce and that there would be a sell the rip. And there was not much in the morning. And then all of a sudden, a huge rip followed by a nasty sell off ending up the day down. And it was a pretty big switch. We actually moved from almost down one and a half percent to up two and a half percent. That's a wild market if ever you've seen one. Which sectors did well though is starting to tell a different story. And this was the first day that I actually saw my bond indicator hold. And that is that we actually saw bonds saying, you know what, we're not necessarily as negative as we have been, and they've been very negative, believe me, over the last month as they were today. We saw discretionary holding against some of the things that usually it doesn't hold against during bad times. We saw TAN, the solar index, something we've been discussing now for two weeks, really have its time in the sun. We'll be taking a look at that later. And of course, a bit of a bounce on things like jets, etc. They were oversold by the algorithms in the previous session. But isn't it interesting that no one was paying attention to this? If you were paying attention to clean energy and solar, you've got to think about it. Are you following the government money? I'd be really interested to see what people's opinions are on clean energy stocks and solar stocks over the next two to three, even five years. Is this going to be a sector that outperforms? Let us know your comments down below. I'm really interested to hear everybody's opinion on that. So it was overall mostly a little bit of risk on actually. We saw technology semiconductors and a mixture of defensive and non-defensive things doing well. A lot of things that are actually sensitive to the tenure, as in usually their growth, were doing better than you would expect. Now, just for anyone that hasn't viewed our videos before, remember one of the biggest canaries for a recession, yes, a recession, is the 10-year, two-year spread. If that ever negatively inverts, basically inverted yield for a period of time, that can be a massive canary in terms of what's going on in the market. Remember, the Fed control the short-term spread, the three-month or two-year to a degree, the market controls the 10-year. So if they don't agree with each other in terms of the growth of the economy or the health of the economy, it can be a massive problem. If you haven't already, come and follow us over on Twitter at FX Evolution. We do share a whole bunch of things. I think this is pretty interesting. Now, obviously, not many people are in the natural gas trade at the moment, and that is you know, something you would think could be going up right now. And it's basically, you know, their reliance on or Europeans reliance on Russia for this. I mean, this is really the ultimate play. If you wanted to cut off Europe now, that would be incredibly costly, maybe not possible. But look at Finland, 99% reliance on Russian gas, Latvia, Bulgaria, obviously, we go down even Germany here, 47%. So there's some pretty amazing reliance here from the European Union on the Russian gas. And it's certainly something that is in the arsenal, depending on what ends up happening here. 
in as this escalates and as this type of thing occurs. Natural gas is not an easy trade, though. It's incredibly spiky and incredibly huge movements. Sometimes people prefer to op open those types of trades with the stocks instead. Let's talk about what's going on with oil. We've discussed the fact that this is usually a bit of a precursor of recessions when oil spikes. Every time is different, but in the past history, it certainly has been one of those canaries. And we also need to understand that while you might be thinking, okay, this is the recession, markets can bounce randomly. Markets can also move up randomly. So if you are a longer term investor, the average excluding recessions is around 15% pretty much where we are with S&P 500 right now. And that's from 1965. If it's going to be a recession, the average is usually around 36%. So just some interesting stats there. If you want to bring things back to being relative and maybe cooler heads will prevail. Obviously, if you love a company and you think it's a winner, why would you necessarily need to sell that? What you would do is treat this as an opportunity. There's a difference between investments and trades. Let's have a look. US 2 versus 10. It continues to rise here. Not a good sign. Obviously, the canary. We continue to watch this and we'll find out what happens very soon, I would say, with that one. The 50-day moving average. So S&P 500 stocks dropped pretty drastically in the last couple of sessions, and they've now pushed down to only 23.56% of stocks are above the 50-day. This historically has been one of those zones that if you are thinking about your investment perspective and you have a longer-term picture on the markets, it's not that bad. Obviously, if it ever falls under 10, it's hitting an extreme in terms of fear. But we continue to watch this. It's something to bring together with your own analysis. The VIX, we've got a pretty big trend line here. This is the fear index. A lot of people like trading this one at the moment. I consider it a pretty scary trade, but <laughs> hey, what do I know? I've been, I've been around for a while, but you know, the VIX is, is definitely not for me. But that being said, it's great to have a look at it. And you can tell here that this 37 level if the S&P 500 goes to a new low, I would so expect the VIX to blow out and go crazy. The algorithms will have a field day if the S&P 500 breaks under key levels that we'll be taking a look at soon. So we'll check that out. PCC, put call ratio, still sitting in the middle, showing a big kind of amount of buying calls. And of course, in this case, there's a lot of puts as well. They're equaling each other out, not too much information there. But where things went crazy was gold. And I've got to say, you know, well done to the community. You know, people that have stuck with the gold trade. Yes, it may not have been a palladium, which we also did bring up here, or, you know, a neon or any of these other things that have gone insane, nickel, whatever else. They've gone crazy. But in terms of a well transition trade, gold has been phenomenal. It has just hit. And you can tell why 2070 might have been a good take profit zone. It has just hit 2070 an ounce again for the first time in a very long time. We're almost about to hit all time highs on gold. So it smashed through 2000. And this is why understanding technical analysis is so great. If you're a first time viewer here on the channel, you know, if you don't believe in technical analysis, just believe in the idea that markets move towards the next most likely resistance or support. It's what we call the participation zone. The FOMO effectively takes over and it moves towards the range. Could you deny that the other price was 2070? Why it hit it? Probably not. And look at the speed at which it went up. And then of course, smash straight back down into the previous resistance finding support. If the markets continue to react with a similar thing, gold still could be moving up here considerably. And I'd like to think that we were one of the first you know, channels really covering it and being bullish on it since December last year. It's playing out, it's still beating the market. And at this stage, you've hit a great level, but there still could be even more to come. And it depends a lot on as we see this situation unfold, obviously, but it's pretty amazing. And I'm sure many people are scaling out at key levels. Considering that, let's have a look at the gold index here. This is the gold trade in terms of the gold ETF, and it's done very well. We've again positioned in this over on this candle. We had big high plans, and those plans got hit actually last night. First big take profit, $40 on the gold ETF hit, rejected. Again, coupling up. But notice how the gold miners are still behind the price over here. Usually the actual, this goes for oil as well. Usually the actual commodity is in front of the stock. The stock takes a bit of time to get, you know, powered up 
and then as it actually follows through. So it's amazing to think that there's still a spread between the top and the bottom here of around 15.73% on the sector. Let's move over to the canary in the coal mine. I guess you would say the first one towards recession, which is US oil and the crazy price. I think this is a tough trade. You know, I've said this now for a few weeks. I know it's been bull, bull, bull. But in between there, if you actually have been trading it, there's been some pretty decent busts as well. We've seen oil a few times drop 8.96%. It dropped over here around 8.83. I mean, if you picked it up, the resistance, the support, we talked about that yesterday. It was a good trade long, no doubt. If you have your entry, stop loss, take profit criteria in, and you're trading you know, a futures market that's always open, then you're more likely to see some form of success. So that's really fantastic that it's actually done some bouncing here. That being said, you know, it's at the resistance. We've just had one of the big bits of news. The way you'll tell this oil trade is over, because I don't know where it's gonna go. It could go 150. Some people now call two or $300 per barrel. I don't know about that. I always think that gets outlandish, but everyone's talking about this. And I always have a rule. If everyone's talking about something, you're getting close to the end, whether it be Bitcoin, whether it be finance stocks, whether it be Apple stock, whatever it might be. If you're in an elevator and you hear somebody that doesn't trade talking about, hey, you know, I've been buying oil. That's my first ever stock that I've ever owned or my first, you know, position I've ever traded. I'm buying oil, kind of like AMC. You know, it's going to go parabolic and then it's going to have a massive blow off. So look for the blow off signs. We'll be following it here on the channel. Something to definitely watch. Now, conversely to the oil trade, we've actually seen Tesla hold better. And this is partially because people believe, and I tend to believe this as well, even though Tesla's costs are going to go up. I was in the store on the weekend and I was looking at the, the Tesla and I was just having a bit of a chat to the person there. And while I was there, people were whinging about the oil price, fair enough, the fuel price. And overall, what were they doing? They were ordering Teslas. I'm not even kidding you. They were ordering them then and there. So it's just this mentality. Now, there's two, there's a bull and a bear case. Obviously, you know, I'm talking more to the investment side. It's a very positive thing in some ways in terms of escalation, but obviously there's a big supply chain question on a stock like this. I think that's why it's holding so well. So in the previous session, we talked about the 800. Let's actually have a look at the 15 minute chart here. So if you were being reactive and not predictive in the market and you saw that nice bull candle in the previous session and it followed through, that's actually a pretty decent buy sign. We thought it would be able to get back to this level here. And I tell you what, damn, it got close and it didn't quite hit it. Where it closed is really the next level around that 825, 828 zone. So look, great profit. Here to here, I think was probably a no-brainer for the session. It went through and kept going and it's held that area. If you're trading this in the next session, you're probably looking for it to breach through these zones towards the bull side. And if it can do that, then I feel like it could actually get through this 860 and potentially even move back up to the previous 880 highs. So Tesla's looking a little bit better here on the charts than it has recently. And you know where the bad problem is. Daily close under 800, bad, 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 bad. Okay, that is not what we want to be able to see here. Apple on the other hand. Now Apple, I don't know whether it's a hedge against the market or what's going on, but Apple stock has held amazingly well. Now yesterday it didn't, and it actually had a big daily negative candle. I watch Apple as a as a kind of like a bit of a market health indicator. And this time around, it's been incredibly resilient with people holding this stock. I'm almost thinking they're holding it and then selling it when they get ready to buy the market or something. It's very bizarre. But we have here this 155 kind of level, the resistance, the supports, the lower peaks or the lower highs. If it breaches through here, it could be a bit of a sell-off here on Apple. And I've, I've cautioned, I don't really like Apple's price in comparison to other high quality stocks in the market. It's my opinion, but yeah, you're looking at this and you're thinking, yeah, if it breaks through here and closes on the daily, not the best for that stock. Let's move over to TAN. So we mentioned TAN over here. We follow If you're following on Twitter, I actually posted this chart and said, okay, this is uh, looking much better. It's had the pullback, fantastic role reversal, great opportunity and two stellar days. This comes off the back of the UN report, but I'll say this. I like to follow the government money a little bit. It's become public opinion, whether you agree with it or not, I'm not getting political here. It's become public opinion that many countries will want to try to reduce their 
position on oil due to the Russian thing, okay? And the Russian-Ukraine conflict at the moment. And because of that, you are going to see, my guess, government initiatives, government expenditure that is going to benefit these types of companies. Just a guess across the world an exp- expedited process into these. So it's just something that's interesting. And I, again, I want your opinion on it. But if you look here, it's hit kind of a resistance. I wouldn't be surprised in the next session to see a sell off. If it starts ramping even more then people are in the trade. But this was the worst performing sector of 2021. It was so bad, like so bad. All of a sudden, it's coming back through. Very, very interesting. This is the DAX. The DAX has actually regained itself. And this is because it actually went against the S&P 500 so hard. It sold off so aggressively in fear. This was absolute mass panic, panic, panic in comparison to the US market. And that's why it's making up some ground. I think we keep watching it. We don't do too much on it at this stage unless you really like the DAX for any reason or the European markets. They are technically undervalued compared to the US right now, though, in terms of ratio over all the time. This is the one that I'm watching for the week. If this rejects back up and the Dow manages to make a big turnaround and get back to a bullish hammer, I'll actually be more confident that even though you might not see it right now, there could be a bit of a turn here towards the bull side. Yes, I said it. There actually could be. If this market goes underneath though, what is this? It's basically a giant Wyckoff distribution. Where would that Wyckoff distribution most likely end up? Back here at the 30,000. I've said this a few times. There are very good bull and bear case scenarios here in the market. And the best thing to do is just follow the price action. So the Dow is certainly a weekly watch and see. We'll be watching that as much as possible. Speaking of watch and see, IWM, if you don't know what it is, the small cap companies in the US, super important to look at them. It's like the lifeblood of the US really in terms of up and comers. It's still hovering, nasty candle in the previous session. We have our support, we have our resistance and everything in here. I like to consider it noise at this stage. So we'll continue to watch that. The NASDAQ, now this sold off. And let's just have a look at some of the key levels that we were watching in the previous session. So I'll go over here to the futures. Well, firstly, just let's look at this. So 13,050, I think we can all agree if the NASDAQ closes underneath there, the algorithms are gonna get involved in the market. So if we get underneath this zone and that daily candle doesn't look good, doesn't look good at this stage. A close above that daily candle, bullish. Oh, wow, totally different story, yeah, absolutely. We, this is how fast you have to be in the markets right now. It, it's it's completely different depending on what happens next. If we break this support though, the S&P 500 will be putting under a lot of pressure and you've got to think the next zone for something like the NASDAQ could be like a 12,000. Yeah, it could be like a thousand points down very quickly. But at this stage, it's on the support. Let's think about what we talked about yesterday. So we'll go through the NASDAQ and then we'll go through the S&P 500. So this is the highlight. I haven't made any edits to it. I was thinking of between that 13.5, 13.6, we would see some type of potential sell-off. Now you've got to be watching it obviously, but that is what we actually saw. We saw a sell-off, a re hit. And if you missed the initial sell-off, what better time than potentially get another flick in for the day trade session. It was actually not too bad. I'm not sure about the buy. I mean, the buy was there, but this was a lot harder to see than the sell-off. So when the sell the rip occurred, remember at the market moment, we have a selling market. Every time it rips, every time it comes up, it's a sell the rip, at least until we breach through. Usually in the past, it was a bull market. So every time it sold off, it was by the dip. It's like a different mentality and that's what's happening here in the algorithms. So just a very interesting zone. But when it gets better is actually when you check the S&P 500. And this is why I say this is the best market from the technical perspective. We have support, support, support becomes resistance. Bam, there it is. There's the rally, actually a beautiful double bottom here on the smaller time frame, 15 minute. It then breaches up and then that's where it sells off from. So again, the sell the rip did occur and it did happen. If we fall through this level, next stop you would think is around 4,100. But I wanna bring in here some options because with the S&P 500, we all know the big kind of case scenario here, the head and shoulders. We close a weekly below this level. All of a sudden we've got left shoulder, head, right shoulder. So let me just draw this up, right shoulder. If we take the distance from the head to the neckline, 
And then we extrapolate that out here. Get rid of that writing. Look at this. 3,800. What is that? 3,800 is exactly or very close to 20% down. Right typically where you see bear markets theoretically start. Okay. I know a lot of you will say, well, we're already in a bear market, bro. We're down so much money. Yeah, I get it. I get it. But that's technically what they say. And here's the big thing that everyone's talking about, right? This is, this is, I hate this particular method. Okay. And that is what I put on the thumbnail today, the death cross. All right. And that is a 50 exponential or 50 moving average crosses below the 200. Now, I know one thing about these moving averages. We all are conditioned the death cross. It, you know, it totally makes sense. It's going to be negative, negative, negative. Yeah, there usually has been more negative, but go back in the past, prove it to yourself. Okay, over here, we see the death cross. Now, remember the death cross is actually the candle after. So it's this one here. Whoa, that was almost the low. So if you freaked out on the death cross, that's a terrible indicator, yeah? Terrible, bad death cross, not good. Come over here, the death cross occurs. Was there more? A more orderly way of kind of declining. The answer, yes, there was. But still, it was close to the end. Then you come back over and you look at other ones, the death cross. And they just don't, well, when they do actually happen, they don't tend, here's one over here. Remember, it's the candle after. It's close to the low. So death crosses are not a good indicator, all right? Anyone that says, oh, the death cross, it's going to take the market out. Yeah, right. It doesn't work. If it worked, it would be easy. I'd put it in an algorithm and it would work. But that's not really what I'm, I'm doing here. And I wouldn't suggest that you, you consider that one. Now, we do have this nasty looking rejection candle. Remember, if you ended up getting a bullish push and it closed above this, let's just say that happened in the next session. Right now, the future's up slightly here. That would be actually very bullish, very, very bullish. And, and, and I would be starting to say, okay, switch. The bond indicator, that the bond concept in the moment, it's not telling me to be as weak as it has been. It's still way, way down though. And some other things are starting to stabilize a little bit, but at the same time, this is the current technical analysis we've got. The weekly close happens. The 3,800 is one of the case scenarios. Regardless of the death cross, all of those things could occur. If you think it's going to be more than that, I'm not too sure about that. We'll have to see time as tell. I say, leave our opinions at the door. Let's go with what the price action is actually going to be telling us. Now, in terms of this week, where do we expect the market to possibly bottom out? I guess 400 for the SPY. So that's 4,000 on the SPX. The reason, there's a lot of puts there. There is a lot of puts there. And I don't know how they've done this, but yeah, the market has been able to suck a lot of calls back in. So a lot of people have been placing bullish bets and bearish bets. It's more of an even spread, but there is one wall that is sitting and that is around that 400 on the SPY. So we'll have to find out what happens in the next couple of days. The market that's holding up the best, it's got to be Bitcoin. I mean, 39.2, pretty impressive stuff here. This 37 continues to hold. The whole ruble situation, I think, is helping Bitcoin heavily. And it's holding this. It's holding the 37. It breaches 37, back down to 32. And I would suspect, actually, at that point, back down to 29 or 30. But Bitcoin, for now, still holding up, looking for it to get past this 39.67 area. And if it can... I think that might begin a little bit of a rally here, at least in the trade. Let's move over to what's going on this week and we'll scroll back through here. We actually just need to go to the next week. And basically we've got some interesting information coming out. I think Thursday's the big one. So we've got jolts opening on Wednesday, but Thursday we have the ECB press conference. I think that's gonna be kind of important. And we've obviously got our CPI data coming out of the US. So the market is going to react off this. That I would say that's the biggest news we've got this week in terms of what's going to go on in the markets. Make sure to watch it. And of course, if you enjoyed today's video, please remember to subscribe, smash that like button, and we'll see you as always in the next one. Bye for now.